Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the principle that Jay Ram has taught us, the three ways to grow a business, and we're gonna change this to three ways to grow your real estate business, all right? So Jay taught me these principles years and years ago. No one was teaching anything like this. In fact, Jay's taught most every mentor that I've ever paid money to in the real estate industry. He's the guy that taught them. So we're, we're gonna break this down to, how can we apply this to your own business? So sometimes when you think about it, it doesn't matter whether you're doing 500 transactions right now. In fact, if you're doing 500 transactions right now, this is gonna make you a, a lot of money because the zeros just get bigger on the opportunity side of things. And sometimes we get that, like Jay says, that tunnel vision instead of funnel vision. So we're gonna break this down into some different ideas in the real estate industry, how to get, you know, increase the number of transactions that you're already doing, how do we increase the unit of sale? So uh, in terms of the average sale, the commission that you typically get, how do, we, how do we increase the unit of sale? And then we're gonna talk a little bit about one of the more challenging ones, which is increase the frequency of purchase, which in real estate, when you apply this principle, it's a little bit more challenging, right? You're not gonna get somebody to buy a house um, uh, every three months from you like you might be able to do at a Walgreens. So uh, this principle does apply though. I think you'll be surprised at what we come up with. So, we're gonna go ahead and write some of these things down. So let's first start with, I'm gonna grab a different color marker just to change it up a bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, more clients. So this is, the, this is the easiest one. This is the one we typically think of first, right? Well, how do I do more deals? If I knew how to do that, I would be doing it already, right? So let me, let me show you a few ways to kind of apply this and you'll get an idea. So referral systems. So we all know that we should be getting referrals, but when you look at the opportunity to grow your business, and you know if you looked at you know, what Jay Abraham showed us, it was like 10%, 10%, 10% across each of these, it was 33% growth. That's a pretty significant number, right? So you know, not much more than that. If you take it at 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, we're getting to 66% or better. And you can easily see how just a little bit of growth in each of these areas, and you could literally double uh, your business pretty easily. So we're gonna look at all the different things that maybe you're underutilized opportunities, you know, assets that are maybe overlooked, and different ways of looking at your business. When it came to referral systems, I remember sitting in the room and Jay asked me the question. He said, he asked the whole room the question. He said, how many of you um, have ever received a referral? Everybody's hand goes up. And he said, how many of you have ever um, have, how many of you have more than one system in place that's automatically generating you a consistent flow of ready to act, approved, top quality, target customer, uh, you know, clients for you um, and, and in place running right now? And, the, you know, one person raised their hand for one system and they said two systems and a couple of hands, everybody's hands go down, right? So when you look at your business, how many referral systems do you have in place in your business? Do you have systems in place for generating referrals? So this may be a huge opportunity. So a mistake I was making, I was, I was selling 530 homes a year, I had never touched base with my clients again because what I didn't realize, because when you look at this, this third one, we get to it here in a little bit, is you know you think about well I sold them a house I mean what 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 more is there I can do right I, I earned my commission so that's a that's that's true however that's true um, they are going to come back to you sometimes three years five years seven years down the road and once you've been in this business a while I promise you you're going to wish you'd stayed in touch with all those people like I didn't uh, so when I went back from from um, the event that I went to with Jay. I started looking at how could I put systems in place. And what I learned was not only are these people referring us business anyways, even if you don't stay in touch with them because they, you know they love you and they want to refer you business, but I wasn't staying in touch with them. I wasn't getting the most out of that relationship. And most agents don't follow up at all with their past clients. So client retention becomes a challenge. But referral systems is one easy way to get a steady flow of consistent clients in place. So if you have a bunch of people, if you sell 10 houses in the next month, then those 10 people could all send you a referral this year. What would happen to your business next year? So it's a pretty good way. One, it's just one simple way you can look at doing more transactions, right? Okay, so let's look at a couple other ways. So the second thing we're gonna look at is, let's look at, um, you know, when, when the business through risk reversal. So that's number two. Let me, let me explain to you what I mean by that. So risk reversal. So I remember, I remember I was getting beat by an agent, um, a really good agent actually, one of the top agents in the country. And uh, I used to go on appointments and I finally get an appointment with them. I was chasing expireds and FISBOs and everything else. And, and um, obviously those should be on this list, FISBO expired. Um, but uh, I was chasing these, this business and I'd go out on the, and the deal and they would lower their commission and they would beat me on the appointment. And it drove me freaking bananas. 
I hate it when real estate agents lower their commission because I believe that we're worth what we charge and we should be you know, paid what, we, what we're worth. So, and, and risk reversal, one thing that you can do is say, listen, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, unfortunately I'm not gonna drop my commission to 4% like the other agent's going to do, but what I will do is I guarantee you I'll sell your home at the asking price or above or we can, you know, I'll charge you nothing or we can take it out of my commission. So there's ways you can use risk reversal. Now, how good of a deal is that? So listen, we're going to sell it at the, at the asking price or you, don't, or you pay me nothing. So what, when, and this is a principle Jay's going to talk about a lot more. I'll talk about a lot more. Uh, Mike will talk about a lot more. Uh, but risk reversal, there's ways that you can win the listing or win the buyer 100% of the time. When you assume all of the risk and they assume none of the risk, you're going to win the deal. So if you put a system in place for risk reversal, you're going to win more of the, of the buyers you talk to on the phone, more the buyers that you present to, more the sellers that you talk to on the phone, more the sellers that you present to, you're gonna win more of those listings, which is gonna in turn increase the number of transactions. So using the principle of risk reversal, you can actually do more deals. So this one's an obvious one, it's marketing. I mean, obviously this is something, well, yeah, Jay, of course, if you knew, if I knew how to, how to market, um, I would, I would be doing that already. But when it comes down to this, we're going to get into this way deeper into the, into the course that we're doing with Jay. Um, and also we're going to get into this in a lot more detail in terms of, uh, some other opportunities that we have to share with you on how to increase your marketing. But if you're not spending money to grow your business, name a business that doesn't have some type of marketing in place. Uh, so it's something you should be doing. It's something you should have a consistent flow of new business coming from your marketing efforts. And we're going to teach more on that, but this is another way obviously of growing the business. So uh, the fourth way, let's look at, um, okay, tell us, telemarketing. Well, you may call this, we might call this prospecting, but in other businesses, um, I'll never forget Jay Abraham said, you know what, um, you know, I, any of the businesses in the room use telemarketing. And then one, one guy's hand stayed up the whole time he's asking these questions and 100% of the business that they had came from telemarketing. That's all they did. They didn't get, they didn't have a referral source. They didn't have any other sources, but 100% came from telemarketing. What can you learn, adapt, adopt, and apply from a company that's doing nothing but telemarketing? And so when you look at that other business, you're like, how in the world are they doing that with telemarketing? They've built their whole business on telemarketing. How can we apply that back to the real estate industry and apply it to your business? So when it comes to telemarketing, you know, it could be calling around uh, the open houses. It could be calling around your uh, for sale by owner or a recent sale or a recent company sale or having um, what I like to do and what you do once you get to a higher level in your business when you're doing three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred transactions is you hire telemarketers to make the calls, build the relationships, build your database for you, and generate leads and opportunities and appointments uh, by calling and, and, and trying to find uh, uh, oper you know, hidden opportunities in particular neighborhoods around a sale that maybe the, that you've, you've made or whatever. But you don't have to do these calls. And when you know how to grow your business and once you get to a certain level and you're making a certain amount of money, you don't have to be the telemarketer, okay? You can hire a telemarketer, which is awesome. So. That's actually the preferred way to do it because I don't like to make calls. If you ask Mike, he would tell you he likes to make the calls. So the fifth, fifth way we're going to talk about, let's see here. Let's, we, got, um, we got special events. We got, um, let's, do, let's do special events. All right, so special events. So this is something that you may or may not have thought about before. Um, when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, doing special events, I would say, you could do open house on steroids, which is something that we teach, is a way to put out a whole bunch of signs, drive 200, we had as many 100 actually in Lawton, which is, is pretty impressive for Lawton. I've heard of, of much larger numbers than 100, but over 100 people attend an open house. That's a special event. You can do buyer seminars, seller seminars. Um, there's all kinds of ways you can do, do special events, use special events to acquire new customers, people that don't already know, like, and trust you. So that's another one that we can do. Uh, let's see here. We can do, all right, uh, acquire list, uh, develop USV. Let's see. Let's see. Acquire, before I forget these. I like this one. Uh, and develop USP. Okay, so uh, acquire list. So one thing that we did in my marketplace was we had an agent that had been around for oh, 100 years, I would say. How many agents do you have in your office that are 100 years old? Like if you really look at them, you're like, they have to be at least 100 years old, right? I, I had agent, I had, had two or three agents in my office when I was with Coldwell Banker that I'm pretty sure they were 112. Uh, just 
old as can be. And I knew they had to retire, but they just never would retire. Are you kidding me? So what happens when they do retire? So good news is I got along real well with these ladies. They were really super sweet and they had a hard time with technology. So they tend to lean on me for questions, but a cool way to acquire a list of potential clients is what are they going to do when they retire? They, if you're lucky, they have that list somewhere. And if you can help them get that list, you can acquire a list from an agent that's retiring or recently retired or quit or moved or whatever and build relationships with that list. Use her testimonial. If she has happy past clients, you can acquire that list. There you go. There's just some new, new clients that you can work with. Number seven, develop a USP. We're going to get into this more in, in terms of a little bit later, uh, but the USP, how do you, how do you, what is your uh, unique selling proposition? What is the reason that people should call you in the first place? So you have to have a compelling reason. If I asked you, why should I hire you above your number one competitor or doing something else, anything else at all on my own, why should I hire you? And if you don't have an answer for that, when you're talking to a buyer or seller, if you just can improve that, which actually this leads to the next one, which is um, increased selling skills, all right? We can help you with all this. This is huge. Once you have a, a USP, increasing your selling skills is just going to get you more. If you talk to 10 people and you sell two now, if we can get you to four, what happens? You do more deals, right? So it's pretty simple. Now, if, you got, if, you, if you're a large team and you have a bunch of agents on your team and you're, or you're building a team and you can get all, if you're not, either you're training your agents or you're not training your agents, either they are saying the right things on the phone or they're not saying the right things on the phone. So if you're spending all this money on lead gen and your agents aren't being trained properly, then could you increase their selling skills and also increase that number? Absolutely. So it doesn't look like just so far, and I'm sure there's a couple more I can come up with. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you a couple of easy ones. Automated follow-up. Um, and this was a big one, right? We suck at follow-up. I did. I don't know about you, but if you're really good at follow-up with long-term follow-up, then, then you're better than I am um, because this is a challenge for us, right? So if you get a system that automatically follows up with your clients and stays in touch with your past clients for you, we use Infusionsoft for that. Um, and we use leads today for that. Those are the two systems that we're using, uh, but you can use any system. Commissions Inc. for buyers is another one. There's, there's a lot of different systems that are out there. Um, you know, we can help you with recommending the ones that we like or you know, do your research. But there's plenty of systems out there that'll do the follow-up so you don't have to do it for you. Uh, making sure that those systems are in place and working to optimum. And if they are, you're gonna generate more deals from that, right? So the last one is, is PR. This one's always overlooked. Um, and actually, uh, um, this is something that Barbara Corcoran, if you know Barbara Corcoran from the Shark Tank, we met her uh, just recently. And when we were talking to her, she was, you know, she was breaking down how she basically sold her company for 60 million was she, she when she was a nobody, she basically was sending PR uh, updates to um, reports, market reports, which is actually ironically the same thing I started doing when I got in the business, um, uh, market studies on the market uh, to uh, the station, to the, uh, to the TV stations in town. And they actually quoted her on a celebrity and ended up, she ended up becoming the celebrity real estate agent, um, you know, that's working with celebrities. And she would write reports like, you know, what, uh, what things, uh, I can't remember who the example was, but say Val Kilmer or some, some actor, um, oh, it was Madonna is who it was. So, you know, she was doing things like, you know, what, what Madonna would be looking for in a home, right? Or in a, in a condo, because that's what she bought or whatever, that's what it should be. So, so there's this report. And so all of a sudden the media started assuming that all these celebrities were buying from Barbara Corcoran. So they were quoting her in the media all the time. And what happens from that? She ends up getting Richard Gere and he buys a house from her. And then all of a sudden now she is the actual um, celebrity to, or the celebrity real estate agent. Ends up selling her company for 60 million. How about that, right? So you, this is free. You should, everything you do, you should always make sure you're taking advantage of the, send it to the newspaper, send it to the TV station, send you know, the press releases to the radio station. This is an easy way to get out there and, and get public awareness of people knowing who you are. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, transaction size. I think we can agree based on the first one, there's no doubt that we could probably grow our business when it comes to uh, more transactions. There's a multitude of things here that you're probably not, you're, you may be doing, but you're probably not doing to optimum um, that could increase, easily increase the business that you're currently doing. Um, now let's look at the, this is unit of sale. So how do we sell? How do we, I, I don't want to sell more houses, right? I don't have any more time in the day. How do I just make more per transaction? Well, we'll show you how we did that. 
So being from Lawton, Oklahoma, and having a business in Lawton, and we also have a business here in Frisco, Texas, uh, which is where we're at here today, and it ain't easy to sell when the average sale price when I got in the business was like 70,000 or 73,000. Showing my age, if you can see real close, there's some gray in here and some gray up here. Um, real estate will do that to you. But uh, uh, when it comes to being in Lawton, there wasn't a whole lot of things I could do. And the average sale price now is 135,000, but um, it's still nothing like what it is here in Frisco, 300,000, your average sale price could be more. But one thing that I learned from Mike that he did really well was what Mike did was he was in a market where the average uh, sale price was uh, probably about 130, 150, which is called the call, and he moved to, the, to Frisco where the average sale price was 300,000. So what happened? So the thing, what he did is he moved markets. With a higher sale price. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that you can do. The other thing you could do is you could just start targeting higher average sale price with your marketing um, you're, you know, you, you may or may not have control over this, but the people you hang out with are going to know people that hang out with them that are going to be similar, you know, so your sphere of influence, the people, the type of people you surround yourself with is going to help you determine whether you're getting the type of referrals you want or the type of referrals you don't want. Um, so moving markets, that may sound like a lot. Mike moved offices, it was three miles and the difference in average sale price was from 130 something thousand or 140,000 or whatever it was to hundred to 300,000. So when you do the average commission, that's one. That's that's a huge number. Number three, I'm going to go ahead and give you this. What is your split with your broker? Your bro brokers brokers are probably going to turn this off right now. But um, this would be great training to show your agents if I didn't do that, right? <laughs> so um, if you if, if you're a broker, I apologize. We can give you an edited version of this. So this is uh, you know split with broker. It, it's obvious if you're doing a bunch of deals. You can increase your split with the broker, wherever you're at, brokerage. You, know, you certainly are going to make more per transaction. Uh, so, you know, if you're giving away money here and you're generating the business, and you're doing it on your own, um, you might want to look at that and consider that. Another way, another way to do that is a, is a transaction fee. Number one, that's probably the number one thing you can do tomorrow that's going to make you the most money. So when you're doing 500 something deals and you don't have a transaction fee times 495, you're going to, you're going to end up with um, a, a whole bunch of money. Do the math on that, whatever it is per month. It was 20 something thousand plus every single month that we make just from transaction fees. All right. So the next one is, let's see. All right. We've got three and a half cent price and split with a broker. Uh, okay, vendor relationships. This is a, another obvious one. So I became frustrated when, when looking at this because I didn't have another market to go to and couldn't really increase my average sales price. So um, I could charge more money, but I wasn't real sure if that was really the direction I wanted to go. Um, so vendor relationships. Um, ask this question, who all benefits when you sell a home, right? Who, all, who else benefits? Mortgage, so you got mortgage, you got title company, who else? Uh, you have what, an inspector gets to inspect it, you got appraisers, you got, you got um, a survey company, you got, in our state, you have an attorney, um, fur furniture store, maybe? Furniture store benefit if somebody uh, somebody uh, uh, buys a house? Absolutely, you, better be, you bet they do. 70% of people that buy a home uh, buy furniture within the first uh, six, next six months. So all of these different relationships that you could have, what we did was we went back and we actually uh, joint ventured with a title company and joint ventured with a mortgage company. So every time I sold a house, I didn't just make the commission, I made the money on the title and I made the money on the mortgage. We just had to disclose it, that's all you gotta do. Uh, insurance is another big one, right? So the insurance guy, who's your insurance agent? So when people that know, like, and trust us do business with us, we go through all the trouble of finding a good insurance agent, finding a good inspector, finding a good appraiser, finding all these good people that do great work, house cleaner, um, finding a good handyman, electrician. If you find a good plumber ever, and, and I don't know where, no matter where you're at, if you can find a good plumber, 
you are a miracle worker because there's no such thing. I've, I've never seen a good plumber. They all, they're all terrible. They all never take care of your client. They don't get it. And they just, I mean, it's always been a pain and it's always been a lot of thorn in our side in my marketplace. So there is one good, there is one good plumbing company. They are expensive, you know, but we're always looking for, you know, like kind of the best deal kind of thing. So I got, I have to give a shout out to Pippin Plumbing because they are pretty bad to the bone, but they're expensive. They're the most expensive. So um, it's a challenge. Heat and air guys. How many people just, I mean, contractors, all this stuff we make these relationships we weed out all the people that are no good and we find the great people and then it's like Angie's list right I mean everybody you can go to Angie's list and hopefully find somebody that's a, a that's a great has good reviews um, or you know let me show you who who is gonna feel absolutely the outside pressure of if I if I give you a client to do business with they're gonna do a good job for, for you as a client because I'm gonna send them multiple deals every year. So they're, if they're doing multiple de deals every year for me, guess what that means? That means that you're making them a bunch of money. Every time you earn a new client, they make more money. So that's a, a huge opportunity for you to create revenue streams and joint venture relationships with uh, an increase. Every time you do a deal, you can get paid. Not, not RESPA approved, see, see your attorney. There is a right way to do this and a wrong way to do that. Have to disclose that. But don't be impossibility minded, be possibility minded. My attorney used to write me a check for advertising every single month. So, all right, so there's probably a couple more here. Um, develop an upsell. So develop an upsell is another way to do that. Um, it, you know, an upsell could be a, a number of things. So you could also bundle on the front end. So let me give you an, an example of an upsell. So, and, and, and really the upsell could be the bundle on the front end actually, but uh, developing an upsell would be, um, if somebody lists their home with you, you could upsell them into a package of services that included staging. Um, and that, that's another way to, we, bundling services is a little bit different. So I'm gonna say these two are kind of really kind of interconnected here. Um, and if you list a house, what do we know that what do we know to be what's best for the client? What's best for the client is that they stage the house, they spruce up the landscaping in the front, and that they you know get a home inspection now so the buyer doesn't kill the deal. If you bundle that, bundle those services, you can offer that up front and you can earn a percentage of that for putting the deal together. So you can make more money on the front end. And that's one way to do it. So an upsell, um, it would be something similar to that. Um, you know, there, there's something you could probably do as an upsell after you sell the client and do, and you know, after they, after they move, you could upsell something. I'm sure there's ways to think about it. You'll probably come up with some better ideas than we did, but these are just some of the ways that we've actually applied these principles. Um, now let's move over to, uh, the last, the last one. Um, all right. So this one is a little bit trickier. All right. So I'm just going to put them underneath this one. So increase the frequency of purchase. Um, how do we get them to, to, to do business more often, right? So real quickly, I'll give you an analogy. Frequency of purchase, if you look at it from like Walgreens perspective, when Walgreens, you may or may, or may not remember this, but when Walgreens was in the middle of the block, they, they all of a sudden, everywhere in the country, started buying the corners and they started moving. And this is actually in the book, Good to Great by Jim Collins. And they moved all the, all the Walgreens over to corners. And there's a reason that they did that. They, they actually had, um, be, the ease of entrance on a corner, they had more access. So they had more ways for people to get into the, into the store, which brought in more new customers and also brought in more frequently uh, customers could come in as well. It was easier for them to get in. They had more access points, more customers, more new customers. The people would come back because it was easier to get into. And another way that they did that was a very interesting uh, concept called uh, the, the um, drop off your photos here. So if you remember, and still even to this day, even though nobody really probably does it as much anymore, um, the, the photos you know, that you drop off, what happens? You come back to get your photos. Well, they knew that you spend $38 every time you go into Walgreens and that if you had to drop off your photos, even though they don't make anything on the photos, that they're able to make money when you come back in and buy $38 worth of stuff on when you come get your photos. So they're able to drop off and pick up. So it's two more, it's one more way for you to come back. So what Walgreens goal was is how do I get you to come back and do more business more frequently, right? So, hmm, challenging, right? Like, cause people in real estate aren't gonna buy another house, right, you know, next month. But what you can do, is you could focus on people who are multiple transactions. You can do people that are um, builders. There's a bunch of these builders, REO, investors, you know, referral companies. Although I don't like paying those high commission 
transaction fees, right? I mean, 28, 38, 35, 38 percent if you're Cardis. If you're Cardis and you're watching this, you're robbing us. Um, but at any rate, so <laughs> you see, I have a little passion about that. Um, builders, REO, these people are doing multiple deals. So if you have one client that only does one deal, but you can have two or three clients that do multiple deals, you can increase the frequency of purchase and focus on some of that in terms of your business. So, um, okay, so here's a couple of other things that you could do. Um, develop a back end. So, so one thing you could do is if you sell somebody a house, you could, you could offer you know, a, a lawn mowing package for your kids and then go mow their yards. Uh, a lawn service. There's, there's all kinds of things, right? All, any kind of services, business, anything you want to do, you could do after the sale for home ownership, uh, home ownership experience, whatever you want to do. So that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a sketchy one, I'll admit. Um, another one that you could do would be, um, you know, you know, retention. Um, and referral system, which is kind of what we talked about before, but uh, just focusing on the repeat. So your your top clients, you know, what systems do you have in place to stay top of mind with your top clients and getting those people to come back when it is time to sell? So we talked about that a little bit. And the more clients, the same things you might be doing with past clients to get to referrals are the same things that you would probably be doing to get them them to do retention. So that has a dual impact on the overall three ways to grow your business model. So these are just these are just a handful of the ideas we're going to be talking about. So this is just a video to give you kind of a, an idea of some of the ways that we've been able to apply this. We're going to get much much deeper into this material. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully uh, you saw the value in it. And make sure you get registered for the three day teleseminar that's going to be with Jay Abraham. It's probably here on the page somewhere. There's also uh, a Twitter hashtag somewhere here on the video. You probably see it right now. Don't know where it's at, but. It's a hashtag. If you want to join the conversation, uh, tweet that and, uh, and with your comments of what you liked, what your takeaways were, what um, maybe how your mind's expanded about how you can take a business to the next level. Looking forward to seeing you in the next video.